Amazing grace That saved a wretch like me. Once I once was lost, all oh, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now. I see Oh, grace It was grace that taught That taught my heart to fear My heart to fear And grace And grace my, my fear, fear. That grace appear, that grace appear in the hour, the hour I first, I first
but now I'm fine. I'm fine. I was blind, blind. but now I see. Greetings and welcome to the March on Washington Film Festival. I'm Artistic Director Isisara Bay. This festival is more to us than films and panels. And so we begin by acknowledging the source of all life and the seven directions, north, south, east, west, above, below, and within. And to the cycle of life of African ancestry people, those who have gone on before, those living and those yet to be born. Because they were, we are. Because we are, they will be. Our 2020 theme is Who Tells the Story? It is inspired by the African proverb, until the lion learns to write, tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Our theme encourages us to research the authentic and overlooked voices of history investigate those who have mistold those stories and open space for each of us to be self-determined in telling our own stories. The struggle for justice and equality is more than an African American or black and white issue. In recent weeks, we have seen the Black Lives Matter protests spark similar protests in other parts of the world and awakened an examination of systemic racism here and abroad. And so this discussion is called Civil Rights and the World Afterwards, so that we may hear in three parts from several women leaders representing diverse communities who are addressing the injustices confronting us as a global society. With me today, is Rokaya Jallo, a friend of the festival, who's shown several of her films with us in past years. Born in Paris of Gambian parents, Senegalese and Gambian parents, she is a journalist, author, filmmaker, TV producer, and one of France's most prominent activists for racial, gender, and religious equality. Among her many educational, community, and organizational leadership accomplishments, she's a regular presence in media as a political analyst and a speaker on stages too numerous to name. 
In recent years, she served as host of BET Friends and just last month, she was named global opinion contributor to the Washington Post. Welcome, Rokaya. Thank you so much, Izzy Sarah, for sending me, hosting me. Yeah, and congratulations on the new gig. That's Thank wonderful. You. Thank you. I'm so I'm so glad because it's a new bridge, you know, between our two countries and our two continents. So I'm so glad to be able to just participate to the building of the bridge, actually. Exactly. And I think on this side of the globe, too, it's important for us in America to hear voices from other parts of the world. So tell us about your anti-racism work and what made you start doing this work? Thank you for the, that first question. It's very important to me. As you, as, you, as you said, I was born and raised in Paris from uh, parents uh, who came from Senegal and from Gambia. Um, in France, the topic of race is very taboo. So I grew up in Paris with several people for, from different origins, different backgrounds, and I knew that I was black, but it wasn't really meaningful to me. So I was just a Parisian kid and then a Parisian teen. And, you know, my neighborhood was very mixed, very diverse. So it wasn't, you know, being black didn't really single me out from the rest of the groups, from the, the rest of the kids. Mm -hmm. The thing is that the more I was advancing in my studies, the less there were people looking like me because Right. You know how uh, systemic racism works. Uh, it's very difficult for minorities to just uh, go through all the um, all the, the the obstacles that come through their, their way when they try to um, to just uh, go out of their social class. So at some point, I was the only black person, and I started to focus many questions. And the questions that really bothered me were the questions who were asking me where I was from. And I, I you know, I really love Senegal, which is the country of my parents. But um, in, in French, when you ask the question, you say, where do you come from? And I was saying to the people, I never came. I was born here. And I have I also had people you know, just being surprised uh, about the fact that my French was so like perfect. And of course it was because it's my language. It's the language I grew, you know, I've been growing, growing up in from, from my whole life. So I started to I started to wonder like why would people um, see me as someone who couldn't be French? Mm -hmm. And I started to watch more closely uh, the films in cinema, the TV. So it was a long ago. And I just noticed that there were no people who look like me when there were black people. Uh, whether they were Americans or they were Africans in Africa, but there, there wasn't really that image of, you know, the person of color, whether the person is Asian, Black or Arab, who was also French. So I started my activism that way. Just my, I, I started my first organization to say, you can be French and you can be like, you can be Black, you can be Muslim, which is also my case. And that doesn't make you less French than the mm -hmm. others. So I started that um, organization with which name was uh, Les Indivisibles. And the other um, goal of the organization was also to tackle the racist discourse in the media because there were many debates about the identity, the French identity. And it was very exclusive. Like um, what everything I, I, I heard, every, everything I was hearing was very brutal to the minorities. So something you touched on reminded me here of, uh, I'm a first generation American, my parents are from Guyana, and I know that the view of uh, Black people in this country is very monolithic. When mm -hmm. there are people from Africa, like uh, immigrants, or from the Caribbean, or from different parts of the states, or African ancestry people from different parts of the world. And so to view, to have that view of individual individuality is important as we can all contribute to the collective. So mm -hmm. you came here several years ago to uh, share with us your film, um, Steps to Liberty, mm -hmm. uh, that was done around the anniversary of the March on Washington. And you paralleled that march with, the, with a march in France and the civil rights movement in France. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, so my, my film, The Steps of Liberty, was uh, directed in 2013. It was the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. But it was also the 30th anniversary of a march that took place in Paris in 1983. And it's a march that was very, very, very visible at that time, but that everybody has forget here in France. And the thing is that that march in, in Paris was inspired by the March on Washington. And it was um, a group of young people uh, who decided to march because one of them was uh, at, at assaulted by the police. And he, 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 like, he spent one month in hospital. And uh, within the, those, uh, the, 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 that month, he spent two weeks in the coma. And when, when he woke up, Wow. He just said, I need to march now. I need to, I need to do something. And he departed with a small group of 12 people from Marseille, which is a, a town in the south of France. And they marched for two months, almost two months. And by the time they arrived in Paris, there, was, there were 100,000, which is like, in proportion, it's even more than the March on Washington. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, to parallel that to, to, to just make people understand uh, that we have local heroes because in France we tend to celebrate heroes from the civil, civil rights from other countries. So we can't, you know, I can, I can, I can say that there, there is like a train station that is named Rosa Parks. There is a, a park in Paris that is named uh, named Martin Luther King. We have uh, places that celebrate Nelson Mandela, but we don't have any places that celebrate that person whose name is Tumi Jaija. So that march was very, it was the first national march against racism on the French soil, because the, what we have in particular in, in, in France is that many of the, uh, the struggles took place in the colonial places, in the places that were colonized in Africa, in Asia. So people here in the French mainland don't really have in their memories all the struggles that were led by the minorities because they took place in Algeria, in Indochina, that is now Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. So it was the first time that on the French national soil, there were a group of people who you know, wanted to say, we are French and we need to end police brutality right now. And it was, it was like more than 20, uh, 35 years ago. So this, this theme that we have now, who tells the story could work in France as well. Um, I know that uh, having traveled to different countries that what happens with African-Americans has been an inspiration around the world. My father worked as a seaman and traveled a lot uh, to different parts of the world and traveled often to South Africa and talked about how the civil rights movement here was an inspiration to people suffering under apartheid in South Africa. So it's something to hear you say that we have that kind of impact in France, but it's to the detriment of the people who are leading activism movements there. Exactly. So, yeah. That's and, and the thing is that it 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 inspire it it inspires all the minorities. Tumi Jaija, who led the march that I mentioned, was from Algerian background, so he wasn't black, but he was a minority still. So yes. we have our own, you know, uh, breakdown of minorities here. And some people would like to parallel and just to 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 uh, to replicate repli replicate what happens in the U.S. But here, police brutality. Uh, is faced by black people, but also by Asian people and by you know Arab people, and it's something yeah. that we we really need to repeat over and over because you know they just want to to say that oh uh, it's 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 just about black people, but we have our own history of colonialism and slavery here in France. Yes, yes. So tell me, what was it about the Black Lives Matter protests here? You think sparked similar? protests like that around the world and particularly in France? The thing is that um, what happened uh, to, to George Floyd, the tragedy was covered large, widely by the French media. Yeah. There was, a, you know, m much coverage uh, and it was very precise. The French media were very able to describe uh, very precisely the systemic racism that was taking place in the US. Yeah, and It was very interesting and, you know, we all understood what was going on and we were all in solidarity with the George Floyd's family. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we were like, we also have problems here. So why are you so, you know, good at speaking about what is happening yeah. on the other side of the Atlantic? And you never speak about what happens here. So a, a, a collective of activists, which is named the, 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 com the Adama Committee, 
decided to organize a, a local protest. So it was named Adama Traoré. Uh, so it was named after Adama Traoré, who yes. was a young man who died in 2016 um, in the hands of, uh, you know, the police. At the police, said, yes. Yeah, it was, he, he just got an ident identity check for no reason in the street and he tried to run. He was arrested and he just died as asphyxiated in the, in the police station. And there has never been, there have never been, there has never been a trial. So the mm -hmm. family is still asking just for justice. So the family uh, of Adama Traoré, uh, who started the collective, decided to just make a local protest with the name of George Floyd, but also the name of Adama Traoré and several of, of the name of people that we don't know because actually, because we know Trayvon Martin, we know by Mike Brown, we know, you know, people right. who died in the US, but we don't even know people who died here. Yeah. So we decided to have that protest in the front in, in front of the, the, the Palace of Justice. And there were so many people. Mm -hmm. Like I've never witnessed so, something like that in my life here in France. There were many, many, many people, like uh, you know, you know, ten of thousands of people. Yeah. Mostly young people, people who were, you know, marching for the first time in their first times in their life. And it was mixed. Like you had, you know, majority of people of color, but many, many white people who were just outraged. To yeah. ju just wanted to say, you know, we're sick of that. We're sick of that. And it's not happening only in the US. We also have systemic racism in France. We right. also have white privilege. We also have white supremacy. And we need to frame that in French. Like it's not something that on, uh, uh, only happens in the US. Even if we, we have a difference because we don't have the same relationship to the guns. So police officers don't use that their guns that much. Yeah. Most of the people who die here in the hands of the police, they die, you know, being, you know, suffocating or being asphyxiated. It's like, it's very I mean, different. When, when they're arrested and taken yes. to the police station. Yeah. Yes, exactly. They, 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 you, it's very uncommon to have people being shot in the street because the police officers, we don't have that culture of gun. But still, even if there are not as many as, the US, as in the U.S., 90% of the people who die in the hand of the police are uh, men who are either black or Arab. Yeah. So it means that, you know, there is, there is a, yeah, there so is there's a, a similarity. Exactly. A similarity in both places. And it's interesting that it was so visible to the French media from afar, but not at home. Yes, That's and there was much more. Like, whenever we try to say, you know, the, most of the debates were like, Yes, uh, we have some problems. Maybe we may have some problems here in France, but we're not the US. Yeah. And, and all the debates I was I was taking place were like that. You try you trying to you're trying to to just to uh, to to say that we are living the same issues, but it's not the same. And you know, I just had to explain to people like all the racist theories that you know uh, were uh, exported to the US. They came from here. They came from here, Europe. So there is a connection that is obvious. The people who, who, who invaded the US, who eradicated the native people and who enslaved black people, they came from here. Yeah. So we cannot not have, you know, make a connection between what's happening in, you know, in, in, in your country and what's happening in mine because it's the same, they are the same ideology. Well, we're talking about a, a systemic colonialism that is the root of the racism. It was just taken everywhere. And it's important for all of us to see that it's uh, in this country, we say it's been different stops on the slave trading boat that exactly. some of us have gone to South America, to the Caribbean and to different parts of the U.S. But the same colonialist mentality has been spread all over the world. So you yeah. mentioned uh, the proliferation of guns here, but not there. But one of the other things we're seeing, too, is this rise in the far right in expressing their points of view, in protesting, in bringing guns to address not just anti-racism protests, but as you saw around the time of the pandemic, dealing with having to wear masks mm -hmm. and in one mm -hmm. state going to the state capitol with with their guns. Um, have you seen in France or what is the impact of any far right uh, sentiments there? I can say that like everywhere in Europe, the far right is rising. Like during the last elections, 
the two the, the last election the far right was uh, you know uh, that they, they were on the the second round of the elections and during the last european election um the far right uh, was the first party you know uh, the, the the biggest party to to get to, was the party who gained which gained the the largest number of voters so in europe we are the country he, which sent the the largest number of uh, MPs at the European far Parliament who are from the far right. So wow. means, yes, yes. So it's uh, they were they were number one. It was last year. So it's it's very concerning, and uh, the far right is is I would say that they are operating in the media. Last yes, I was going to ask if there was similarity with social media and the media. And the media, the mainstream media, actually, like the mainstream media. Actually, last week there was um, uh, there is a, a woman who is a MP, a national MP. Her name is Danielle Obono. So she's from African background. She, uh, she was born in Gabon, mm -hmm. and she came uh, very little uh, as she was very little in in France, and she was elected as an MP in three years ago. And since the day she has been elected, she's been constantly attacked. Uh, you know, they say that it's because of the of ID of her IDs, but it's not. And last week there was a like there is a magazine who who has decided over the summer to to make fictions. Uh, in the fiction, you have politicians who are uh, sent in the past, and so it was every week. And she was one of the hero. The hero. I read about this. Did you yes, read about this? Was, I read about this. Yes. She was sent in the past to be an enslaved woman. Yeah. And mm -hmm. over seven pages, wow. they describe her in a very offensive way. It is horrendous. She And they, and they made a cartoon of her with mm -hmm. the chains. And she was wow. naked with the chains, with her face. So it was, it, you know, it's like... It's well, so what I find remarkable about something like that is when it was, the attention was called to the periodical, they were so innocent. Oh no, we didn't mean that. It was just exactly. a story. Exactly. Why would you take it that way? Exactly. Oh, so, oh we're sorry if she's hurt, but it's just yeah. a story. And uh, it, it was just to show how slavery was horrible. And they decided to not to to put her in 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 as 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 an enslaved woman uh, in the hands of Europeans. She was in the story enslaved by Africans. Wow. So they just yes. wanted to say. Yes, African did that before we did, and you know it's not it's a, it's something that we should tell about. And I I've I've I've, I've, re I've read the story all over, and it was so sexy, so racist, so offensive, and and you know at some point they're still there. So you just yeah. mentioned uh, you teed up my next question, which has to do with um, what we call intersectionality. But I want mm -hmm. to ask if you could. What do you think are the most critical issues you face or the most critical issue you face as an activist um, in racial equality and anti-racism work? Is it treatment by police? Is it economic inequality? Is it social inequality, for example, around what's happening with the pandemic and health or around work or education or that social or cultural equality? I know you've written a lot about, as a feminist, about women's dress and clothing, um, or is it religious inequality? Um, which do you find you are addressing the most, or is it a combination of all? I think it's a combination, but I, I, I have the, I really think that police brutality is a major issue because when, whenever we have had people, uh, you know, have, we have had uprising, uprisings in, 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 you know, the most impoverished, impoverished neighborhood, it was because of the police. And it's not only in France, in the French mainland, but also the, in the overseas territories because, because France is not only in Europe, but also as territories in the Caribbean, in the Indian yes. Ocean, in the in the Pacific Ocean. So it means that we are the only continent, the only country who, uh, which has such a presence on, you know, almost all the continents. Lately, for example, there was, uh, you know, a young young boy who was protest protesting, um, uh, you know, around envi environmental, uh, you know, issues in Martinique. So it's an island in the Caribbean, and it was it was. It was attacked by the police. We have the images. It was it was just beaten out by the police. So it didn't die, but it was it was so brutal. It was insulted. Yeah. At some point, there was a big 
stain of uh, of blood on the on the on the you know in the street, and you see the the, the police officer cleaning. Wow. Cleaning. Yeah, it's 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 very very shocking. So I think that police brutality is a major issue issue, and I would say that also the access to health. Yeah. Yeah, because what happened during the pandemic is that the most the poorest department uh, in France, uh, which is also the department where you have the largest number of minorities, was was the one in which you have the, 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 you know so many people who died, so many people, and because many of those people you know that they, they, they couldn't afford to stay at yeah. home, so they, they worked. They so they had to go to work, yes, oh, and they God. waited until late to get medical help, and exactly. the medical help the facilities closest to them were the least equipped. Yeah, it's the yeah. same thing here. Same exactly. Thing here. No. So to me, it's it's, a, it's an issue I, I'm trying to work on because you have the access to health, and you have also also the fact that um, you know when you suffer as a person of color, you're not really taken seriously. Mm -hmm. So you have to suffer a lot to be just to be taken care of. Yeah. Yeah, so, we've noticed the same thing here. When we say we're in pain, it's not seen as pain. Uh, yeah, I understand that. Uh, I'm, you spoke a little bit before about how the French view the civil rights accomplishments here in the States. Uh, so I think I'm going to jump to the question where I ask you, if you have a message for African-Americans in the States, from where you are, what would it be? I would say that um, just go on. Like I really encourage you, and I'm I'm glad to see what's going on now. And I think that we would be stronger if we were more aware about you know what's going on in the other countries. Yes. So I'm glad to be able to speak to you, for example, today. But those conversations need to to take place more often, to just to, to circulate from one point to another. Yeah. So maybe they should watch films that black people, people of color in France make, uh, should try to see what's going on here in Germany, in the UK, to have like a more global conversation because because we've been inspired by the US for, the long, for a long time. And I think that the insp inspiration could go both ways. Both ways. There are things that, that we do well here and there are things that you do well and it's something that would make us i think uh much stronger and it's like it's about black people and white supremacy but also trying to see how other minorities are dealing with those issues yeah and the majority population how they are exactly. changing their points of view are responding exactly definitely and you know i would say for example what is interesting in, in france is that uh you know, um, all you know, people who are even now who are active in the U.S. as uh, civil rights activists, they are revered here in France. They are so mm -hmm. respected. Yes. And there, the, you know, so if you are, for example, a person who are, is an activist in the U.S. and you 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 feel that you're very welcome uh, in another country, mm -hmm. ask about the local people. Yes. Ask about them. Don't be the person you know hiding what's going on there. You know, when Tana Hissicott was here in France, he understood that very quickly. Yes, yes, you know, yes. He understood that, you know. He did, and he wrote a lot about it, too. Exactly. How the, we, there is a double standard. Uh, we love African-Americans, but we don't like Africans. How yeah. that can it work? It, it can't work. So, like, you know, and, and, and I do the same. It's my responsibility, because when I go to the U.S., I'm a French woman, so I have my accent, and I know that people are very interested into what I, in, into what I have to say as a French person. But I, I try to connect with you know black, you know, minorities, American minorities, because I don't want to be treated differently and to be, you know, to say, oh, you're not the same. You're French. You're so sophisticated or whatever, yeah. because it's not true. It is not true. We have so much in common. I'm so yes. happy to virtually yes. connect with you between so the Thank U.S. You and that. France. Thank you, Rokaya. I'm you. so proud of you, and I love watching how you walk in the world. Thank Take you. Take good so care. Much. Thank you. You too. All right. All right. Let's continue our discussion, civil rights and the world, afterwards. I'm speaking with women leaders representing diverse communities who are addressing the injustices confronting us as a global society. We'll focus on what connects and unites us across cultural, 
political and geographic borders as we continue our collective anti-racism work in the world. With me now is Chumtoli Huck, Associate Professor of Law at City University of New York School of Law and the founder editor of an innovative law, media and social justice nonprofit called Law at the Margins. She has served in leadership roles in the New York City Office of the Public Advocate, the Asian American Legal Defense Fund, New York Taxi Drivers Alliance, and as producer of the 2015 documentary, Workers' Voices. Monica Ramirez is an activist, author, civil rights attorney, social entrepreneur, and speaker on behalf of farm workers, Latinas, and Amer immigrant women. The daughter and granddaughter of migrant workers, she has founded and or led such organizations as Esperanza, the Immigrant Women's Legal Initiative of the Southern Poverty Law Center, Justice for Migrant Women, and Latinx House to celebrate excellence in film and entertainment. Her Dear Sisters letter, written to lend support to Latina migrant women, went viral, was published in Time Magazine, and helped to spark the Time's Up movement. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you. And Great I'm loving all the colors on the screen. <laughs> That's great. Okay, first question. Um, Chamtoli, talk about the community that you're in within the US that you represent, what's its size and population? Sure. So first of all, it's really an honor to be here and also just an honor to be uh, on this platform with um, Monica, whose work that I have known. So I just wanna sort of give a fellow shout out to a sister warrior um, and Isisara. I know that you've been have deep roots around social justice. Um, so I just first wanna give gratitude for each of you um, so community has different meanings. And so I'm going to share the sort of multiple communities of which I feel an affinity to. Um, so one is um, I was born in Bangladesh and I came to United States as an infant and I grew up in a working class community, multiracial community in the Bronx in New York, mm -hmm. um, multiracial in terms of immigrants from all over the country, African-American and of course, um, Puerto Rican community. And so that's sort of the I also think of that as my community yes. as well. Um, I'm Muslim uh, American. Uh, I uh, moved from the Bronx and now I reside in the Bronx. I sort of I reside in um, in Harlem. So you know I see the sort of our neighborhood as part of our my community and identity. So in terms of Bangladeshis specifically, Bangladeshis are one of the first fastest growing Asian population in the country, there is an actually accurate census account. So I hope that everyone actually participates in the census, it's really important. In terms of last count, I believe there's about uh, a, a million uh, Bangladeshis mm -hmm. throughout the country. Bangladeshis are part of another identity called South Asians. Yes. Um, and South Asians hail their ancestry from the subcontinent as well as individuals who are from the Indo-Caribbean, so Trinidad and Guyana. Yes. And so that's also part of the South Asian community. And um, the last thing I wanted to just mention is that um, I am uh, a mother and spouse to a Dominican American, so I'm raising multi-racial children. And so I think thinking about our communities much more elastically and expansively is really important to me. Stop yeah, I, I was thinking about that as you were speaking, because I mentioned before, my parents are uh, Afro-Guyanese, yes. but the larger population in Guyana, which is in South America, is South Asian. Yes. So a lot I've seen that inter, uh, intermix. Sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't uh, in some of the most far-flung places. Monica, tell us about you. Well, thank you for um, having me here as a part of this conversation. It's really an honor to share this space with you. And, you know, so much of what Chantelay was saying really resonated with me about sort of this broad definition of who is our community and where do we yes. come from. Yes. You know, I come from migrant people. You know, my family for generations migrated all around the United States, picking and packing the, the food that we eat. And so uh, very much feeling on the outside of communities and trying to figure out what our place was in community. And so, you know, this question around community is a complicated one. 
for us. And um, but having said that, you know, I'm a, I'm a third generation Mexican American. My family came to the United States to work in agriculture, and eventually, thanks to the support of two farmers, actually. Uh, my family was able to settle out of the migrant stream in Ohio, which is where I was born and raised. And so for me, my identity and my community are closely tied to coming from a migrant farm worker family yes. and also being a rural Latina in the United States. Yes. And, uh, you know, there are two to three million farm workers in the U.S. who uh, work in the fields, who work in packing sheds, and who are also engaged in work in nurseries. I think a lot of people don't know who the farm worker community is in our nation, primarily mm -hmm. because farm workers are invisible. Um, but the overwhelming majority of farm workers in our, in our country are uh, Mexican, Mexican American, and uh, more than half are undocumented. So our community is one that has very much throughout the history of the United States sort of straddled borders and um, and as a result of that has been really impacted by many of the policies in, in, in this country, much of yes. this has been about exclusion. Um, and so in terms of my personal history and, and my family settling out of the migrant stream in Ohio, you know, we are one of few Latino families in this white rural community where I grew up. And, you know, the story of rural America in the United States is one of uh, white people. It's not about the, the migrant families like mine or other people of color who live in these communities and really are the background, you know, the backbone of these communities. And so um, it's really important for me to talk about the fact that I am a Latina, one yes. of 60 million Latinos in this country, one of 30 million Latinas in this nation. And I am a rural community member and our identity as rural people needs to also be honored as we talk about the history and the story of the United States. Well, that's so, so many things are coming to mind. As you said that last year, uh, we did an event and one of the speakers was a white professor from uh, Western Carolina who talked about black people living in Appalachia. It never crossed my mind. And I also know as an East Coast urban raised person, I rarely think about rural communities and know nothing about it. So I'm hoping that in this conversation, we can all kind of expand our notion as to what home is and what country is and all of the, I love how you say out of the migrant stream. I think we all kind of have moved in rivers and streams, but migrant workers more than others because they're moving a lot. Mm -hmm. So tell me now about your anti-racism work. Um, how do you, what is the focus of what you're doing? I know intersectionality is something we are all coming to understand more and more, but are there specific areas that you emphasize? Monica, you start. Well, you know, my work and in, in my career has really been rooted in trying to win justice for the farm worker community and, and namely for farm worker women. And uh, my, my anti-racism work has really been around the fact that migrant workers and farm workers in our nation were purposefully excluded from the most basic labor protections in our country. And that was because of racism. And at the time when these labor laws were passed, it was to exclude black farm workers from receiving protections. Oh. And then with time, it was uh, more uh, Latino farm workers. And so much of my work has been trying to address the fact that for more than 80 years, farm workers have been systematically excluded because of racist policymakers um, at the deprivation um, of rights to our community and our families. And that has had a long, uh, long term impact on our lives. And so um, my work is really focused on labor, but I can't do my work without also focusing on immigration and immigration policy. I, you know, and also, you know, the racism that shows up in the way immigration policy is enacted and has been applied across our nation. You know, white immigrants receive more privileges under our immigration system than those who are non-white. Um, and then certainly, like, really thinking about how um, women of color are impacted by the labor policies and the immigration policies, you know, those are those are all pieces of my work and and, and sort of overlaying everything is anti-violence and how um, yes. women of color in particular, black women, Latinas, um, native women have um, been hurt not only by the systems um, and the laws of our nation, but have been 
and continue to suffer physical injury and harm by people against them because of the way that we look and the way that we present in this world. And I think the vulnerability mm -hmm. of, of the work that we do sometimes as well, being the low person on the totem pole in environments that are not safe. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. Chantali, what about you? Chantali. Sure. Um, so I would probably characterize the sort of arc of my work um, broadly as around economic justice. And so, um, so part of it actually overlaps with Monica's work around labor rights um, and ensuring that individuals um, seek, get protection. And, and as she mentioned, a lot of workers are actually excluded, domestic workers, farm workers excluded from a lot of labor protections. Of course, the National Domestic Workers Alliance and other groups are really fighting to, uh, for inclusion. And we know that these have a very um, racist history, right? Mm -hmm. Exclusion of um, women of color and particularly black women from, from labor protection. Um, and, but also there is, um, you know, barriers to enter the market um, that, for example, um, criminal record, credit history, mm -hmm. these are used as like proxies um, mm -hmm. for exclusion, but they oftentimes have a disparate impact on, on African-American and Latinx um, workers. And we see that um, when workers are, are not able to enter into the labor market, um, and particularly jobs that are higher paying that could at least bring them into a middle class lifestyle, mm -hmm. um, we see actually how the law sort of functions actually to um, deprive, and I would go far to say steal wealth from, um, from Black and Latino communities. Um, and, you know, there's a long history in the United States of excluding, um, you know, also Asian Americans from owning land. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very powerful history of um, Sikh and Punjabi workers marrying uh, Mexican Americans, you know, because they couldn't actually own land. So um, when we look at the current data in terms of black wealth and we look at unemployment on every single marker of economic justice, um, you know, uh, black communities, communities of color are at, at the bottom. So a lot of my work is sort of trying to remove those barriers and to work with community-based organizations to like organize for better um, rights so that um, individuals can really live a dignified um, life, you know, which is really afforded under international human rights doctrine. So using this human rights lens to say, yeah. We all have a light right to live a digni dignified life. Mm -hmm. um, and so a, a bulk of my work sort of deals with that. And of course, it intersects with violence. It intersects with um, issues of gender, immigration. So mm -hmm. we look at all those um, those aspects. And um, so I'll just, I'll just pause there. I think that's okay. So I, I like that word organizing because I think it's one that is very little understood. People say mm -hmm. it a lot. I remember when uh, President Obama was running, uh, the opposition kind of made it a joke that you yeah. know he was just hanging out in communities. But you both have had leadership roles in organizations and uh, you're an educator. Uh, but how do you organize? What are the strategies you use to organize your constituents within the larger constituents? Um, let me start there. And, and then how do you, once you get people organized, how do you use the levers of power? Which, which mediums do you use for that? So talk to me first about how you organize. So, you know, in the farm worker movement, you know, we believe that we have to start organizing within our families. So if we can organize our families, then we can organize our workplaces and we can organize our communities, right? The family is at the center for us. And if we can um, get our family members to um, sort of be on the same plan as the rest of us, then from that very small nuclear um, uh, unit, we can then start building power. And so my organizing has always really been modeled after the larger farm worker movement and, and some of the tactics that have been used in the farm worker movement. And, um, but, you know, I think that with time, the way that we organize has changed greatly because, you know, originally, I think a lot of the work that I've done has been focused around uh, a rights-based organizing, sort of educating people about what their rights are, where, where the rights uh, where they should have more rights and sort of figuring out how to try to win rights in the context of, of being denied rights. 
And what we understand now, and I think sort of the evolution of my organizing has been that, yes, we have to fight for people's rights and we need to educate people about their rights. But if we don't change culture, yeah. and if we don't address sort of the, the cultural gaps that exist and the narratives that exist about some of our communities that have permitted it laws to exclude people and systems that have harmed people, you know, if we don't change that, then- Can you give me an example? Of yeah, what yeah. So for example, you know, uh, much of the work that I've been doing as of late, and you said this at the beginning, relates to the work that I've been doing in the context of the Time's Up movement, mm -hmm. right? That movement was, the organizing that happened there was we had to, to create a space in which women workers across industries were able to see themselves regardless of how much they earned or what they were what work they were doing we, they had to be able to see themselves as part of this much bigger um solution yeah. to a problem right so when we were able to bring farm worker women together with women in hollywood and they are very different but they were able to yes. see each other and the similarities and the problems that needed to be addressed that was then an opening that we were able to organize around and find yeah. the common goals. And so, but in order to actually achieve our end goal, which is to end sexual violence against women workers across any industry, we had to change the narrative about who are women workers? Where are we working? What are we working towards? How are we building power? Like all of that work had to be done because historically what's happened is we're pitted against each other. Yeah. Right? And, and if we didn't do the work to actually change the story, then we couldn't do the work of changing the policies and the practices exactly. that are harmful. So as an organizer, I, I use the tools around um, rights-based organizing and, and sort of figuring out how to get people to work towards improving their workplace conditions and from a white rights-based perspective. But we also are organizing around what is our story? Mm -hmm. What is a story that we want to be told so that we can then use that story to then help push change um, on a larger level? And sometimes that means lifting up the contributions that we're making. And sometimes that means lifting up the harms that we suffer. But if we don't change the story, then we're not going to actually be able to change the conditions. You know, the theme of this year's festival is who tells the story yeah. uh, because of that proverb. Um, I say it at the top of, of this segment um, until the lion learns to write tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Mm -hmm. um, and when you speak about having uh, women and Hollywood women coming together, in the work that I do around uh, consciousness raising and personal growth, I find that people always assume that whatever problems they're having, they're having them alone. Yeah. And so they don't talk to each other about it. So we don't know when I was in a corporate setting, I had a mentor who said, you know, you women have to start telling each other how much money you're making because this company is paying all of you less than the men and some of you less than some of the others. Yeah. But because we don't talk, so that introduction does indeed open a space. It's so to true. You know, and just to that point really quickly, you know, the breakthrough that happened around the Time's Up work that we that eventually came was, you know, farm worker women were shocked that these w really high profile women mm -hmm. were finally disclosing the sexual violence against them. And they were, and farm worker women were able to say and see that just like farm worker women are paralyzed by their isolation and by the fact that they've essentially been erased by society, these very well-known yeah. women were paralyzed by the light yeah. that they shine in, you know? And, and, and so they were able to draw that connection and that by drawing that connection, that then gave us the opportunity to push for change jointly. Yeah. Chum Tolley, what about you? What does organizing mean for you? I want people to understand that it is an actual thing you do and it yeah. involves talking to and touching other people and making things happen or helping things to happen. So, Yeah, um, well, I'll start with actually one of my um, heroes, um, Ella Baker, who was a contemporary of um, MLK and I think oftentimes doesn't sort of get sort of the, the, the kudos or the credit, but absolutely has a, a quote I'm going to paraphrase, which is strong people don't need leaders. And so when I think about community organizing, it's really about building political power for those who are most impacted and most marginalized. 
-hmm. And so that's front and center. Um, there's a whole literature on community organizing and I'm really happy that you lifted that up because I hear it used very loosely. So just yeah. like 101, um, Community organizing encompasses multiple sort of uh, aspects. You know, there are issue-based organizing, there are campaigns, and mm -hmm. those are really important where you lift up a particular, you want to change a law or you want to raise a particular issue. But to me, community-based organizing is a long, um, you know, sort of grassroots commitment to the community in which you're part of to build their political power. And I always say that my job is to not have a job, meaning that mm -hmm. ultimately I should not be necessary at all. So community organizing is, is really with the intention that at the end of this process, the individuals that you're working with can speak for themselves. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's this expression, I don't know where it's attributed to, where you know, the voiceless can't speak. Um, well, we have to give them the mic, right? And yeah. so we have to kind of create the culture and I guess Monica's talked about culture so that folks can speak up. So part of the work around community organizing that I've done is precisely that, but using law and using communication. So a lot of the margins were sort of emerged because I realized that we needed a platform, a media platform, so that folks who oftentimes are not heard can speak. Uh, and I don't have to speak for them. You know, they're, yes, and right. they're perfectly fine speaking. Some of my early or, um, experiences as a um, sort of lawyer organizer, I had a um, domestic worker who was not um, proficient in English and she had to give a, a rally speech. And she said, you know, here's my speech, you do it. And I said, well, how about this? Why don't you give the speech uh, and I'll translate. But I want you to be on the mic. I, yeah. I didn't, you know, and she said, well, people are not gonna understand my language. I said. Well, maybe people need to learn Bengali. I mean, yes, okay. yes. Um, and yeah. it sort of relates that story. So just really building political power um, is front and center. And, and it kind of goes to my theory of change is that change will only occur through mass-based organizing and supporting people to actually bring about change. So the March yeah. on Washington, mobilization, and really you know building people's capacity for change. Um, I do that primarily as a lawyer and now as an educator, um, but it's really sort of cultivating new voices so that they're front and center. We we see them. Uh, and, and, and they see themselves, and they see themselves. Mm -hmm. in that position. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you brought me to um, mm -hmm. the next thing I wanted to speak about, which is so many people are uh, in the over the last over this summer have been using their voices and their bodies in protests around the country and the Black Lives Matter inspired protests around the country. How has that impacted your communities? Have they participated? Um, has it opened something up within your constituencies, this bringing forth this presence? Because we've seen it all over the world in some places. Yeah, so, you know, both within the farm worker community and within the larger Latinx community, I think that one of the things that has happened is we've we've made more space for communication around the fact that we have to confront anti-Black racism in our own community. Right. So when when the marches started happening and the protests started happening over the summer, you know, one of the things that I said to folks on our team is we really have to have this conversation within the farm worker movement about the fact that the farm worker movement is painted as if it is only um, a Latino movement. But the reality is there are black farm workers in our community and there are black Latinx farm workers yes. who are in our community. And we don't yes. talk about them enough and we don't hear about their work enough. And so that so we need to confront that um, anti-black racism within our own movement. Mm -hmm. And then within the Latinx community, you know, there was a lot of conversation that was having being had about, you know, um, Latinx people for black lives and things of this nature. And there was um, you know, a lot of pushback because people said, but there are black people who are also Latinx in our community. Absolutely. And they, you know, Latinx for Black Lives, then we erase those who are in our community who are also Black. So I yeah. feel as though over the summer, I've seen a lot more conversation about what it means to be Black Latinx in our community mm -hmm. and what it means also to be in allyship with people who are Black, 
but are who are not Latinx. And mm -hmm. um, I know that um, I read a, a data point that said 21% um, of, of Hispanic voters um, said that they participated in protests in March, marches over the, the this summer um, in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. So I think that number is important, but for me, the conversations that we are pushing ourselves to have around um, allyship and also mm -hmm non-erasure of Black people within our community and our movement is really important. Yeah. We were speaking before we started, uh, Chamtoli, about the video I saw of the uh, South Asian, the, the Sikh store owner, yeah. um, talking about how he felt his people had been positioned to be the stop at gap between um, white people and Black people and reminding uh, everyone that it may have been easier for his family, because he was second generation owning the store, to own a store than it was African Americans in the community and to not put people in categories without realizing that oftentimes we are either complicit on purpose or we are moved into a complicit position in this society. So how what would you say about the relationship between African Americans and South Asians um, and what this summer's protest has brought forth in that. Yeah, so, you know, the South Asian um, history, yeah, there's sort of almost sort of two tales, right? There's sort of the often repeated tale of um, the Immigration Act of 1965, where most South Asians immigrated. Um, but there is another story, which is at the turn of the century, there were Bangladeshi migrants who were undocumented, jumped off ship and settled into different communities um, like Detroit and Harlem. Mm -hmm. um, my friend Vivek Bald has a really great book on that called Bengali Harlem mm -hmm. and intermarried with African-American and Puerto Rican uh, you know, women. So that's a really working class story. And I think that we, when we talk about identity, I think it's important to sort of talk about sort of how that thread also sort of gets erased. Um, but you're right that I think w the way in which structural racism and white supremacy works, and there's countless examples of it, is to position the South Asian, uh, and I would, you know, as sort of this, you know, middle person, you know, the middle minority. Yes, exactly. Right? right? That, oh, look, they're doing well, so therefore, um, you know, why aren't you are able to do well? And mm -hmm. so I think that there is that kind of... Um, positioning that happens. and But there's a lot of deep history in terms of uh, solidarity. Yes. I had mentioned a um, site that is called Black Basie uh, History. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois um, talked about caste in India um, years ago with um, uh, 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 a revolutionary figure named Ambedkar. Um, and so connecting uh, race and, ca and caste. Um, yeah. MLK talked about caste system and um, you know obviously was influenced by the South Asian independence movement. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are multiple histories like that that are actually emerging now with the uh, selection of Kamala Harris as VP because of yes. the VP. So that's been that's generated all of these conversation. Um, but like Monica said, I think in the South Asian community there needs to be and there is happening uh, conversations around anti-black um, racism and understanding our positionality and that we have a choice. We can actually uh, stand in solidarity or we can be complicit. Um, the other area that I wanted to mention that, um, you know, South Asians and Bangladeshis are also Muslim. And one of the things I didn't mention in terms of statistics, the one fifth of the Muslim population is African-American, right? Or, um, or a black identified. So when we talk about Muslim organizing which is another area that I've been deeply involved in, we automatically assume that the person is South Asian or Arab origin. Right. But we know um, that Muslim organizing um, by black Muslims have, uh, have actually predated during the rebellion and during slavery. And so, and up until of course, the most notable black Muslim as um, Malcolm X. So even in the Muslim community, we have to have a lot of conversation around who is presented as, um, you know, as as Muslim and know our histories, and so yeah. there's a li lot more kind of going back to that. Um, I have an interest, you know, kind of a really fun story of a friend of mine um, who's featured in the Bengali Har uh, Harlem, Aladdin, whose father owned a restaurant in Harlem, 
And he, he, his father apparently related that um, because it was one of the few places you can get halal, which is kind of a requirement yes. for Muslims. Yes. Um, so because by Bangladesh culture, Muslim, yeah, by culture, that uh, Malcolm X would come into his like restaurant, right? And uh, because that's where you get halal food as a Muslim. And so I, I think that these histories are just need to kind of be mm. lifted up more. Um, they're there, um, but they're not given dominance because it doesn't really serve the interest of keeping us separated. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So this is why it's important for us to initiate these bridge building moments. So yeah. just uh, for our final question, just quickly, if you had a request of the African-American community or a message to, what would it be? If you had the megaphone for the country right now. Yeah, so if I had the megaphone for the country right now, uh, you know, my message to the African, com African American community would be, you know, to know that there are uh, 60 million Latinx people, some of whom are also Black Latinx people who share the struggle and also see the solutions that we all need in order to improve our lives and you know and our livelihoods and who are you know committed to fighting for not only our rights but also for the dignity and humanity of our people and you know our communities have been left behind for far too long and one of the things that gives me great pride great joy and great hope is that we are creating the world of our dreams and we're building it together by organizing step-by-step step along one, alongside one another. And so I, I'm grateful to the leadership of all of the African-American organizers and leaders who have really helped pave the way for the changes that, that we need and that we're seeing. And I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to continue uh, to build together. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I I feel so. Um, I don't really have any message because I feel like the message, main message, would really be a uh, thank you for um, sort of um, you know years of generosity. You know, in terms of welcoming, uh, like as I mentioned, Bangladeshis into Harlem, Detroit, which are predominantly Black communities. Thank you for a, a radical uh, prophetic tradition um, in terms of resistance and resilience. Uh, thank you for laying down um, a pathway so that we can join you in terms of the struggle for human rights. Um, enormous amount of gratitude in terms of um, the sacrifices, the um, resistance, the, the enormous amount of violence that um, communities of color had to experience. But despite that, um, to, to kind of continue on. Thank you for Nina Simone, for Billie Holiday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for giving me, like, when I'm just like really feeling down and I'm like, can we do this? Yeah. Uh, and I just go to Nina Simone and I just feel like, yes, we can. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, and then I guess the last thing I would just say is that we're here, South Asian community. Um, broadly um, to move away from like transactional solidarity, like what we can do for each other. And I wanna shift towards a transformational solidarity, which is what we can all do um, together. And I guess that would be where I would end. Well, thank you both of you uh, for joining us, for bringing your color and flavor and history and culture and wisdom. Thank you, Catherine, for working hard this whole uh, hour. We appreciate you. Um, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of the festival. I hope you get a chance to catch some of uh, some of the other things that we're doing here. Great, thank, thank you great. so much. Thank you. Yeah. We continue our discussion with a dynamic woman leader from down under. I had the privilege of meeting Lisa Mumbin a few years ago at the Woman of the World or WOW Festival in Catherine, which is in the Northern Territory of Australia. Lisa is chair of the Jawan Association and has been working for decades advocating for indigenous territorians. She also chairs or serves as a director for several other organizations focused on health, land issues, and arts and culture. A wife, mother, and grandmother who keeps her faith, ancestors, 
family and community top of mind, Lisa was recently awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia for her great work. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella. Good to see you. Great to see you. Tell us about your community in Australia. What's its size and population? The size is pretty big. Um, I'd probably say about um, uh, 30 to 40 kilometres, you know, in those square kilometres, but um, it's a small town mm -hmm. where it's also the crossroad of, um, of travelling, you know, from each state. Uh, the closest city in near my town is about 364,000, uh, sorry, 364 kilometres. Yes. North of um, Catherine. Is, so, that yeah. Darwin? Is that Darwin? Is that Darwin? Yes. Darwin is the capital city of um, Catherine, yes. And what's the name of your town? It's called Catherine. Okay. So tell us about the anti-racism work you are most focused on in Australia. What aspect of social justice is your emphasis? Do you work mostly on education or on self-governance or on political engagement? It's more like um, self-government, um, you know, focus, you know, and trying to deal, the, deal with the day-to-day -day, um, society with our people to ensure that we are, you know, being, um, we're kind of more or less, you know, being respected in who we are as Aboriginal people in, in the Northern Territory. And you know, even the links that we do have right across the state of Australia, other states. So it's, 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 it's a challenging in life, but um, look, we've come a long way as Aboriginal people. Yeah. And we're, we're still continuing the fights of um, our rights here mm -hmm. in the country of Australia. So what do you think are the biggest problems you face in your work? Um, the biggest problem is trying to build our people, you know, in in strengthening their their well being in life to ensure that um, you know there's job opportunity, there's training opportunity, all things in in life today. So um, you know, our society today is um, is is very challenging, and um, and we're kind of using you know working. Strength is strength with our with our people, and what we're trying to gain is is our land to 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 work through those issues that we face in life day to day. Is health a big problem in your community? I noticed when I was there, there were uh, a number of dialysis centers. It seemed that health, uh, diabetes, and kidney failure uh, is a problem. Is that so? That's that is so, and it's very true. In in my town, we do have three big health organisation, Aboriginal organisation, that try to deliver the service in in all you know all the areas that we have from the west to the east. Yeah. And in Catherine alone, which where I am the chairperson of the health organisation that is called Welly Welly Jane, the effectiveness um, in life today with our people is so high rate that um, it is sad to say that uh, a lot of our people uh, do have high risk of health and the one that you named is is just so outrageous. And yeah. this is where we're trying to get on top of our health. Yeah. Do you find that uh, part of the problem could be uh, the diet and that the way that you eat now is different from the way your people had traditionally eaten? Do you find that soda or 
uh, fattening foods is more of an issue than it had been decades past? Of course. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of really affected our people in life. And um, we're now trying to work on how best we can get back and strengthen our people in, in, in living traditionally because yeah. they, what we found in, in health today is when we got going back out bush to live on our traditional food, it, it helps us. It gives us the strength and everything that comes with our health. So um, it's really hard to say that a lot of our people now is living in a community and in town such base and um, it's not kind of helping. And as, as the chairperson of an organisation, but dealing with matters for over a decade in my work, it's it's a, it's a challenge in life today, and um, you know we're we're working very hard to you know as well as we're trying to create employment, which we are for our people. But there is really underlying issue that needs to be addressed in terms of our health here in the Northern Territory, Australia. So, what do you think is the most effective tool that you have? in the work that you do as a leader. I'm gonna remind you of something, Lisa. When we first met at the art center there, we were introduced and the way the WOW Festival was set up, it was a meeting of Aboriginal women and the white women who were farmers or worked in, uh, their families lived in the area. And so this was, a. Uh, um, the second time you all had done this WOW Festival working together. And after the person who introduced us walked away, the first thing you said to me was, you know, they're very racist here. Do you remember that? It was, and it is still is here in the Northern Territory and probably right across uh, the country of Australia. And um, it's, it's, it's a challenging subject that we do face every day. And it's in all level and it's also in all race. The, the, the fact is, but also the truth is, racism still exists. But as I said earlier, I believe that you were frozen then through the technology. Um, the WOW Festival on the day we gathered, it was a significant time because that was the first time a small town like Catherine, Catherine actually got together and been part with the non-Indigenous people here in this town. Mm -hmm. We gathered in that place, you know, to to get that feeling among each other, but also how we could built our relationship, mm -hmm. not only on that time and that place of that gathering, but how can we make a difference in the town, a small town like Catherine? And it wasn't the only time that I, I, I experienced racism. It was also when my tribal group were, were, were fighting for our land. Yes. So, it goes back a long way, and our land was handed back in 1989. And, and last year, we celebrated our 30th anniversary with the fights that we've gone through, and it was pretty significant. But the, the journey still goes on, and the fight still goes on, on on when best we can actually build that relationship and accept each other differences. Yes. And it's not on colour, but in human society today. Yes. What do you think are your people's greatest strengths? What helps you hold on all these years? Our greatest strength is our, is our culture and our land is our greatest strength. Mm -hmm. And that was, that what's really make us 
live on and move forward in our life in Australia. Lisa, what do you and your people feel? What are your general observances or thoughts about African-Americans in the United States and our own liberation struggles, the civil rights movement, or even recently, the Black Lives Matter protests here in the United States? It's, it's real moving and it's real. And just speaking of this, of it, I feel like I'm connected with Black Americans, and that's what we all feel. You know, given that the, the the video that was linked right across the country, the continent of this world, yeah. it it moved us in in something that we as people, as human, you know, we share the same common, even though we're different countries. You mm -hmm. know, we probably different race but we are we are sharing that same thing in common i'm not really sure you're you talking know. about the video of of uh the police with his knee on the neck of mr yes. floyd yes yes, yes. And, and um just um i think before that we had an incident here in the northern territory a place, a remote place in our community of, of, of a shooting. Mm -hmm. So it kind of brought us, you know, close together. And, and we were watching, we were watching American, what they were going through at the same time. Yeah. We were dealing with the same sort of matter here in the Northern Territory. So, you know, it brought us close, mm -hmm. whether we were in, in so distance between each other, but our spirit was actually, you know, brought With together us. to, yeah. Yeah, to really give each other the strength as Indigenous, mm -hmm. as Black people yeah. Yeah. In, in, in two countries, but even probably more than that, because I know there was a lot of other, you know, Black people were, were watching and feeling that movement and how we were comforted together yes trying to deal with what took place so if you could send a message to the people of the united states to the african americans who are here as the leader of your people what message would you want to send to us now you know we're coming up on an election and things are getting more and more tense uh, so many people are now looking at ourselves, looking at themselves and seeing the attitudes they've had and how they have to change. And it's also a struggle of power and control. So what would you want to say to the brothers and sisters who are here in the States? That's a really tough question. And as I sit here today and reflect on on two countries and and us as, as black people, my message would be there is hope. Mm. I've always focused on hope. What lies behind that hope? is embracing each other, collecting each other, standing for each other, for the better of all. Brothers and sisters in that country in America, you are the strongest people there. You are the longest people there no matter what direction you came from. You need to build that trust and gain your strength as black people. And that's what needs to happen here. Until such time we do that and focus on hope in human society today is what can bring your nation together. 
I know we're still not there, we're probably halfway to it. Yes. What we are going through is what's going to help you and me in the future for our country. Lisa, thank you so much. I appreciate those heartfelt words. We wish you all the best in your work. Blessings to you and your family. Thank you, sister. And my blessing to you as well and your country and your people. If there are a way we can connect and keep this connection together, by all means, let's make it happen. Indeed. And I know through you, through you we can make that difference yes. in our challenges. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who's tuned in for this discussion and for all of the events in this year's March on Washington Film Festival. We hope you've learned from the stories that you've heard. We hope you are inspired to listen to the stories of others. We hope you are moved to lend your voice and your hands to the fight for freedom, justice, and equality. You are needed now more than ever. March on. Oh, yeah. Yeah.